today once again we will continue with what Praveen has started uh, and uh, I would like him to complete the series so that there is uh, no there is a continuity to what he's discussing. Before that let us uh, ask for God's blessing on our time together. So join me as I pray. Loving gracious father we just thank you that we can be here together once again on a Wednesday evening which uh, is something that we do look forward to. And today, Lord, as we uh, engage in a discussion and uh, continue to sharpen our understanding and knowledge uh, about the Bible and about the Bible personalities and especially Jesus Christ, our Lord, do continue to inspire us and open our minds, be with Praveen as he brings uh, in, uh, relevant thoughts for us to keep in mind for this day and age uh, that the biblical message will continue to be uh, in inspiring and relevant to our lives. Committing this study into your hands, asking for your blessings upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Over to you, Praveen. Okay. Good evening to you all. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as you know that we are studying the life of Paul. Uh, in the first, uh, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, I spoke about uh, the lessons we can learn from the life of Apostle Paul. And uh, the last week, we started uh, discussing about the theological themes Apostle Paul uniquely introduced to the Christian world, which are mentioned in the Bible. And uh, we have discussed uh, various theological themes and how they were being developed, uh, how they were based in Apostle Paul's life. And uh, the first thing we discussed was the Trinitarian monotheism that Apostle Paul was not uh, interested in just knowing God and just talking about uh, a, a God who is monod monotheistic, which means one person, one God. But uh, he's very much interested uh, to know more about uh, Trinitarian God who is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was worshiping the same God and he was encouraging all the churches through his letters uh, everywhere he exp expressed it trifold uh, footprints of father son and the holy spirit as well as a trifold experience of every believer uh, in which father son and the holy spirit play major role in that spiritual experience that's the first thing we dis uh, studied and then um, the second thing we studied was one of the uh, very prominent and important um, the theological themes that his church is the body of Christ. Apostle Paul, through his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he realized that uh, church and Christ are very closely united and knit together through which he developed the theme that church is the body of Christ. That is the main reason. We are not working more like corporate companies than any organization we work more in the form of, uh, uh, sorry, in relationships, in harmony with one another, one another, and uh, as uh, the members of the body, uh, and uh, where we all will be led by one spirit, having one father, uh, and having one head, that is Jesus Christ. Entire world, there are so many denominations, so many differences, but still we all are called one church, the universal church. Uh, you might have heard from the teachings of our, uh, uh, our pastor in the, in the previous uh, sessions about uh, church history. There is one church universally, though we are different uh, congregations in many places and different denominations, uh, and we all are a part of that one body. That is the theme Apostle Paul developed, and uh, he communicated the same through his letters and his uh, uh, writings. And then other theme we studied was union with God. And the purpose of Jesus incarnation, according to Paul, was to bring union between God and man through uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ and uh, through which um, we are brought closer to God. And in fact, uh, Apostle Paul's epistles, especially the epi uh, epistle of Ephesians, completely teach us about uh, we in Christ, that's why everywhere we go, we'll be greeting people, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, father in Christ. These kind of words we use because we all uh, adapted them from um, uh, 
uh, Apostle Paul, actually. So he taught us that we are in Christ. And then in Colossians, everywhere he speaks about Christ in us. So we are in Christ, Christ in us. And, uh, and Colossians, he concludes saying that Christ is in all. So and through all. And uh, so that he may have preeminence. And, uh, and it is please the Lord that uh, he wants to, uh, what we call it, um, uh, unite everything through Christ. That's what Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, uh, where he explains about uh, the union humanity has with Jesus and Jesus, how uh, he is united to us and how we are in him. He is in us. We are, in, uh, we are indwelling in each other now, just as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indwell in each other. They invited us into that relationship. And uh, the last theme we studied was equality of all humanity. There is no Jew, no Gentile. Uh, there is no male, female, no, for, no slave, no uh, rich, poor, black, white, or whatever we talk, the differences which we are talking. There is no, I mean, uh, separation between uh, any of the communities. He brought all humanity together in the body of Jesus Christ. Through the cross, he broke down the differences uh, we have. So Apostle Paul is the one who spoke very much about it. And uh, this particular topic has been very much discussed uh, uh, through Jerusalem Council and uh, various uh, other subjects when we, uh, I mean, especially the topic of Ebionism and all, uh, we studied about it. So uh, Apostle Paul is the one who spoke very much and very strongly about you, uh, equality of all humanity. So in Christ, uh, there is no special. So even we as we Christians, uh, there, is, there are lots of Christians that are not comfortable with uh, their ethnicity and they want to somehow identify themselves with uh, Israel and Jews. And we don't need to do that. Uh, it is God who drew the boundaries as Apostle Paul wrote in Acts chapter 17. He set the boundaries for the nations. He destined where we should be. So, and he is the father of all. Apostle Paul writes in Acts chapter 17 itself. So, uh, as, Christ, uh, as Christians, we, all, we are not becoming any spiritual Israel or anything. So, lots of people, when they talk about spiritual Israel, it is, it is most of uh, their, uh, some kind of thirst to identify themselves uh, with the stories in the Bible and uh, uh, relate themselves with Israel. But... There is no Jew, no Gentile. We all are equal. God treats us equally and there is no special treatment. God chose Israel for a purpose and he fulfilled that purpose. That is to bring Gentiles into the flock of God. So Apostle Paul speaks very much about it in book of Galatians, the book of Rome, in book of Romans. He made very clear uh, statements about uh, uh, equality of all uh, humanity. And then... Uh, Today, we will be discussing about another theme, which is related to what we have already discussed. And uh, we, have, we, are being we are discussing about it from uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, that is the law. Lots of people spoke about the law. Apostle Paul also spoke about the law. But Apostle Paul's perspective towards the law is, com is completely teleological this is this is it i know this is a theological and technical term teleological which means understanding a particular subject based on its purpose okay telema means will or purpose from which the word teleological has come understanding anything based on its purpose so the law is there Apostle Paul's perspective about the law is completely based on the purpose of the law. It is not just blindly doing whatever the law says as the Pharisees did and uh, they troubled people, but it is understanding the purpose of the law and seeing how it was being fulfilled in Jesus and how it can be fulfilled in us. So that is the perspective Apostle Paul has taken in term, uh, when it is come to law. So Apostle Paul says, law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter uh, uh, 7, 
if we read he had given a very big uh, description about about uh, the law he spoke quite a bit about it and he says in romans 320 saying therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified uh, in god's sight for by the law oh, sorry for the law is the knowledge of sin law teaches us what is sin what is not sin so law is basically the knowledge of sin and the purpose of the law is to show us sin the knowledge of sin the next perspective from that is law shows sin law shows who we are law is not given so that we may obey it and show the righteousness from us let me repeat law is not given so that we may obey it and show how righteous we are the law is given so that it may show us how sinful we are and we may understand that we are totally corrupt within inside we are helpless in uh, so we are helpless to become sorry we are helpless in finding uh, or uh, we are we are helpless to become righteous by our own we are helpless we cannot become righteous by our actions or by our religiosity so the purpose here the law what law does is not to make us beautiful or to bring the beauty out of us but to show us that we are totally corrupt within inside it may show us the reality uh, even james show uh, james uses an analogy saying law is like a mirror mirror can show where the you know where the problem is and mirror cannot make us beautiful mirror only can show where there are problems in us it can show only the problems within us but it will not make us beautiful so primarily the law is more like a mirror and law is not that we may obey and bring the righteousness out of us but the law is to show us that we are corrupt totally the outside sins when when we go to the law we find there are list of sins that we become uh, we we do those list we will encounter so the question the law puts in our hearts is why are we doing all this because we are corrupt inside so we cannot save ourselves we need somebody to save us and uh, that is the reason apostle paul writes in galatians uh, 2 verse 24 and he presents law as a guide to faith law is not given so that we may be, obey it and become righteous but it may lead us towards faith law is not to push us towards works or deeds law encourage encourages us to have faith in somebody in fact the faith in the savior of the lord we cannot save ourselves as i said before law teaches that we are totally corrupt within ourselves so we cannot save ourselves we need somebody to to save us so that we may look unto the lord we may look unto god for our salvation in faith that's what he wrote in galatians chapter 3 verse 24 uh, he says therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to christ that we might we might be justified by faith so here he is showing the purpose of the law his his um, his perspective is more focused what law can do it is not what we do with the law in most of the times when we talk about the law we ask the same question are you obeying the law properly or not are you keeping all the commandments or not are you breaking any commandments more of this language we use but apostle paul uses the language what law can accomplish and he says law accomplishes in teaching us that we are totally corrupt and we need a savior and it encourages us to come to jesus so that we may put our faith in jesus so the law is more like our tutor to bring us to christ to lead us towards faith it is all the purpose based understanding and he also says law only reveals sin but jesus alone can redeem us from the sin as i said the analogy uh from um, james the mirror can only show us where the problem is 
but the mirror, it cannot correct us. So if we have a mark here, we stand before the mirror. Are, are we going to lose this mark? No. The mirror only can show what the problem is. The same way, law only can show that there is some problem with us. We cannot help ourselves. But Jesus alone can save us and he alone can provide us the solution. That's what written in Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 2 and 3. The law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Apostle Paul calls the Old Testament law as the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in likeness, sorry, in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he commended uh, sin in the flesh. So what the law could not accomplish, God accomplished it by sending his son. The law was not able to make anyone righteous. It, is, it, it failed in doing that because that is not the purpose the law was given. The law was not given to make us righteous. That is the very reason it could not accomplish it. It failed. So God sent his son Jesus so that he can redeem us, he can save us, and uh, he can make us righteous uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And let me tell you something uh, which may trouble many of us. Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, verse 5. He says that sinful desires were aroused by the law. This is the way he says. For when we were uh, in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Because we were in the flesh, because of our weaknesses of the flesh, the sinful desires were aroused by the law. That is why wherever we Indians, we all know, wherever it says, no, don't, do not touch, that's what we want to touch. This a kind of curiosity we get. You know, when it is, when it is, when, when some, we read something restricted, an unknown curiosity works in our hearts and minds so that we, we want to find what is inside. Whenever we go to museum and all, we find very difficult not to touch those articles, isn't it? All of us, we find it difficult. Okay. So there is a kind of uh, system that works uh, through the law. That is because we are weak in the flesh. Whenever a, there are some restriction, this curiosity works. That is how, uh, as Apostle Paul said, the sinful desires were aroused by the law and they were leading unto Having said that, let's move forward in uh, our perspective about, Paul's perspective about the law. And next thing is, quite interesting thing, the Apostle Paul says, that is, we are dead to the law. We might have spoken so many times about uh, that we are no more under the law. Of course, we are no more under the law. Christ has delivered us uh, from the law. That's my next point, of course. But we were dead to the law. Do you know that? Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, verse 4, saying, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit of God. And also Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. Here also he says, For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. He says we are dead to the law. We are we are heard that we are dead to sin. Let me tell you, as Christians, we are dead to the law also. So as long as we are alive, we will be under a law. Once a person dies, he will be free from that law. So in Christ, we all were dead and rose again from the dead. We are new creation. That's why we are no more under the law. And in fact, we are dead to the law. So when we say we are dead to the sin, the equal manner, with the equal intensity, we need to also consider we are dead to the law. How sin could not have power over us because of Jesus' resurrection. The law could not have power over us because of spirits indwelling in us and his work in us. 
So we are dead to the law. Are we talking that there is no more law that we should not uh, keep or uh, uh, the, the law has nothing to do with our lives? I'm not saying that. We are no more under the no more under the oppression of the law. We are no more under uh, the power of the law. Because in Christ Jesus, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are God, God has brought us above the law. What I meant by that is, the law is no more going to command us what to do. Or we are no more under the law to take the commandments of the law and to obey it. But the law has been for, changed into the form of, it, changed, it was transformed into a spiritual form. Now we will do the will of God out of our own hearts and our own minds. The same thing was written in the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 32, as well as Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. Uh, we see where the Lord says, I will write my laws in their hearts and no one tell his brother, know the Lord or obey the Lord. We all will obey. You read the word, all shall obey the Lord. That's what the Lord said in Isaiah, Jeremiah and Hebrews in the new commandments. How everyone can obey the law? It is because God has written the law on our hearts. The law, we are no more under the oppression of the law, but we are above the law and the law has been placed within us now in the form of the spirit. That's why Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 verse 6, we are delivered from the law to serve, the, serve in the spirit. We are delivered from the law so that we may serve in the spirit. It is not that we are kicking the law off and there is nothing to do, but it has been transformed and we are no more under that oppression. But by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are going to, we are called to live in the spirit in which we will be fulfilling whatever the law speaks. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held. So, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Look at this word. We are called to serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the <coughs> oldness of the letter. What is the oldness of the letter? It says, this is the commandment. You obey it. You do it. But what is the newness of the spirit? We understand that we are dead to the law. And who is the one who is giving this commandment? And now we are we got into relationship with this person who gave us the commandments. And out of that relationship, we are going to work. So that is working in the newness of the spirit. We are no more working under the oldness of the letter. The oldness of the letter is, it is written, thou shall not so do so and so, so period. Thou shall not do. You cannot ask question why and uh, shall I just try or if there are any other ways to crack it? No, nothing can be done because that, uh, that is called, that, I mean, that is what called oldness of the letter. When it, uh, the commandments are written, every word as it is without taking off even a single jot out of it. But now we are going to live in the newness of the spirit. So that is the purpose uh, of the law. And that is how Apostle Paul looks at the law. And if you have any questions, we'll uh, discuss them once we start our discussion. And the next important theological theme is vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ. No apostle spoke about the vicarious life of Jesus as Apostle Paul did. We all know that Jesus Christ has died for us. He, he left heaven. And he came down to earth, he born, lived and died for us and rose again from the dead for us. That is what called substitution. Christian teaching is not just substitution. It is beyond it. Jesus did not just die in our, as our substitution. We were supposed to die, so in, in our place Jesus died. That is part of the truth. But that is not the completion. 
Christian teaching about which we are talking, this particular thing is called atonement. Christian teaching about atonement is not substitution, but vicarious life of Jesus. What is the difference between vicarious life of Jesus and the substitution? In substitution, Jesus comes and takes our place. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, my daughter committed some, uh, something wrong and she was supposed to take the punishment. But instead of my daughter, I went and have taken the punishment. That is called substitution. But what vicarious life is, it is much more than it is the next step. It says, uh, uh, according to this, Jesus did not just die for us, but he rose, uh, sorry, Jesus, he did not live dead and rose again from dead for us, but he lived, died and rose again from dead as us. Can you see the difference? Jesus did not just die for us or Jesus did not live for us, just live for us. Jesus did not just rose again from the dead for us, but he rose again from the dead as us. That is why Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, if one died for all, then all died. This is a vicarious life. If Jesus died, then all died. In the previous case, as I gave the example, when my, my daughter was supposed to take punishment, but in her place, I took punishment. Nobody can say my daughter took punishment. But in this case, Jesus died. When Jesus died, we all died with him. That is the vicarious life of Jesus. The same thing he also writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. <clears throat> Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, he, he says, For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. One of the most important and most common scripture we regularly hear, and Apostle Paul quotes and says this in several places that we can find in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the Son, I live by the faith in the Son of God, or faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I was crucified with Christ. Apostle Paul was never been with Christ. He never met Christ. But he says when Apostle Paul, when Jesus was crucified, I was crucified. If you read Romans chapter 6, uh, that is my next uh, verse, but I'm just bringing to your notice. Uh, he says, I was crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, rose again from dead with Christ. How? When Jesus died, he died. When Jesus rose again from the dead, he rose again from the dead. Just give you, let me give one example. Um, uh, I will be uh, taking the questions uh, once we have done. One more theme is there. After that, we will have a discussion and we will uh, take the questions, uh, Pastor Chandu. Um, so, we all know, as Paul said, we are in Colossians that we are in Christ. And in Ephesians also, he said we are in Christ. So, consider this bag is there. And we are, there is an article in the bag, this bag. If I threw this bag in the water, what is thrown in the water? Is it only the bag is thrown in the water? Or the bag? And the articles within inside, within the bag also are thrown in the water. The, the, the articles and everything that are inside the bag also are thrown in the water. So we all are in Christ. We are created in him, through him, for him and by him. There is nothing that is outside him. And all things consist in him. You know this verse, right? By Apostle Paul. All things consist in him. We all are in Jesus Christ. That is why when Jesus died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he rose again from dead, we rose again from the dead. And we are going to experience it in complete fullness in, in the days to come. That is what vicarious life of Jesus. Jesus did not just die for us, 
but Jesus died as us. So what is the difference between these? When somebody dies for us in substitution, we are just escaped by the from that particular incident. In other words, uh, in, in the previous example, as I said, my daughter is just escaped from the punishment. But in the vicarious thing, what is going to happen is whatever Jesus is, we are going to become. That is why Apostle Paul also writes, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. We are taken up to heaven and we are see, being seated in heavenly places with Christ. Because he has seen us, he has seen the vicarious life of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus is, we are now. In Jesus, we are uh, created. In Jesus, we are redeemed. In Jesus, uh, we are even baptized. In Jesus baptized, we all were baptized in him. And in Jesus, we were dead. In Jesus, we were buried. In Jesus, we rose again from the dead. And in Jesus, we are glorified. And we are seated in the heavenly places. And we are going to experience it in fullness in the days to come. That is the perspective Apostle Paul brought. So Christian atonement, understanding of atonement is beyond substitution. And uh, the last uh, theme for today I would like to bring before you is baptism. Apostle Paul brought a unique perspective for baptism. Uh, he writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 5. Or do you not know that as many as, uh, uh, as, many as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as <coughs> Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is what Apostle Paul says we are doing. Dead with Christ, buried with Christ, raised again from dead with Christ, and just like Christ, we live, should live in the newness of life. What do we find from this? His perspective of baptism. We understand it is talking more about our union with Christ. Baptism is talking more about our union with Christ. We identifying ourselves with Christ. Okay. It is a um, we, we, we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ through baptism. Let me just, just finish you with my notes. That is a perspective Apostle Paul was taking. And in the same baptism, in our union only, our justification, our sanctification, and our glorification happened. That's what Apostle Paul, that's why Apostle Paul explains our justification is in our union with Christ. That is the theme of entire book of Revelation, sorry, book of Romans. That's where his theological themes take, chapter, especially chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and even 8. And our sanctification in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul writes, this is all again our union because of our union with Christ. We will be we are sanctified. And we will be glorified completely. And we, in fact, we are glorified. We are going to experience it in fullness soon. soon. First Thessalonians, even there, Apostle Paul explains. Read the entire book of First Thessalonians. We understand that in union with Christ, we are being glorified. So baptism is more about our union with Christ, number one. And from our side, it is we identifying ourselves in the death, burial, resurrection, and glorification of Jesus Christ. It is we identifying ourselves with Jesus. And our justification, sanctification, and glorification also accomplished in our union with Jesus Christ. That's what the baptism, our baptism speaks about. So uh, these are the three uh, major, the some of the major theological themes uh, uh, we can learn from Apostle Paul's life. And uh, there are so many Old Testament images which Apostle Paul has taken and developed, and uh, we'll we'll uh, have a look at the look at them also, uh, maybe in the next session. So as of now, we'll cl we'll close it by discussing about uh, these three definitions. 
So uh, after no, the, this, discussing about these three themes, number one about uh, looking at law according to its purpose, and number two is uh, a vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ, and number three, our union with Christ and our being, uh, we identifying ourselves in Jesus Christ through baptism. I would like to do, uh, leave you with this question. I would like to ask you to discuss about this question. How do we experience Jesus in our lives? Does this, according to uh, the themes, Apostle Paul has spoken to us. What, what I meant by that is, how does these three themes make difference in our experience in comparison with other religious other religious perspectives which tell that you do this you don't do this but apostle paul always in all epistles this is a pattern he follows number one he says uh, uh, who god is god is father son and the holy spirit he brings and how he is related to humans and what are the implicate what are the changes he made which the changes and our what is our position in jesus that is what we discussed in these three themes and at last, he tells us what we should be doing. That is what living in the newness of life. And the <clears throat> uh, commandment, so what he says is, this is how we should be living. Such explanation, exhortation would be at the end of all his episodes. This is a pattern you'll find all, in all his episodes. Okay. So having studied, discussed about these three topics, which teach us about our position in Christ, how does it implement? How do you feel? Uh, it is going to affect your personal spiritual walk. That's what uh, I would like to leave for the discussion. And if you have any questions also, feel free to ask. Pastor Chindu, you raised your hand. If you have uh, any questions, feel free to uh, no, 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 no. I don't. I don't have any questions, but uh, your things is clarified. Thank you. Have it my way. Yes, while you're all thinking, we just wanted to uh, welcome Pastor Chandu, who's joining us today. Uh, he lives in Hyderabad, and he uh, has been closely associated with us. So we hope that our association will continue to be. Uh, yeah. you know, to mature and uh, you know progress as we move along. So welcome, Pastor Chandu, to our Bible study. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Chan. May, may I ask if you, if you are comfortable? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, pa, hello. Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Chan, for inviting me in, uh, in Bible study, and thanks for your support. Thanks for your encouragement. Yeah, we're happy to have you with us. So the floor is open now for any questions that you might have or the uh, discussion point that uh, Praveen brought up. Anyone want to move ahead? I think Franklin, did you have a question? <laughs> sir? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, some general, uh, general request, sir. Sir, if you can please announce the topic uh, one day in advance. Uh, also, now, if you can please, if you can please tell us the points that you will be elaborating. Ideally, I prefer that you share your uh, brief brief on with us. So that will help us and help me at least not to come and participate. Uh, right. Okay. Well taken. I think uh, you know. I mean, uh, we can do that for next time. Okay. Maybe just give us a, a, a gist of what you're going to discuss. Ah, uh, yes, the points. At least the points. Right. Okay. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. To add to what Mr. Poppet said, just mentioned, suggested, I would also like to suggest if these, uh, the brief or maybe these Bible studies, which are so, so very, very important, and God is opening our hearts and minds to receive it, and you're, you know, you're all being anointed to teach us. Uh, could it be? Uh, uh, could it be included in the our you know GCI India newsletter, or, or could it be something separate? 
um, like uh, you know, maybe a uh, let it be a soft copy. It uh, needn't be uh, if it if you can send it, uh, send a hard copy. A printed uh, copy would be helpful. But uh, these things, you see, if we have not taken it down, written it, we could. I don't think I will remember it tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, such valuable uh, material that we are receiving through Bible study. Thanks to God who is using you, Ms. Zekra and uh, Praveen, so wonderfully, you know, and helping us to grow in the grace and knowledge and uh, for God's, uh, you know, fulfilling his purpose for us. Our hearts are being opened to know the truth. Could this be sent in uh, for us, you know, to have a, like, open a folder and have this Bible study material in there? As we're not writing it, <laughs> I... You know, as of now, I know these points which Praveen just mentioned, and uh, even the earlier Bible studies. But I don't think I can, rec I wouldn't be recalling it in total, or, you know, correctly, or even I couldn't, uh, I may not remember tomorrow morning. My suggestion is to please uh, preserve this valuable material and send yeah. it to us. We, we got your question. Uh, Praveen, you want to respond? Uh, as I mentioned previously also, I'll be giving the notes uh, of all the sessions I may uh, I presented uh, <clears throat> at the end of uh, my series. I'm giving, I'll be giving all the notes to you. Same with Mrs. Zachariah too, if you yeah. could do the same. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to also remind you that I think we uh, are taping this and we put it up on our uh, on our. Channel. Uh, on our group. So these are all available uh, on YouTube. Isn't that right, Praveen? Yes. So these Bible studies are all available on YouTube. So you can access them even if you, you know, want to. But like Praveen said, he will be sharing your note, his notes with you. So uh, is that okay? Same with you, Ms. Zakari. If you could yeah. also share the notes. Sure. You we see what happens if it's, if it's on YouTube or if it's, uh, you know, um, uh, if you say it's on the website, uh, we are probably, you know, many of us probably in the in the senior years are not so savvy about uh, looking up the website or looking at the YouTube. If we have something, especially this important material like this, it's yeah. for our spiritual growth and development. Have it sent to us. Uh, right. Even say, uh, not even a soft copy. Send a printed copy if you can. Uh, that yes. will really be very uh, helpful to us. We can open a folder for these Bible studies. Yeah, so I'm presuming that you need it also in written form. Obviously, yeah. uh, you know, some people may like it in written form. Some people may like to hear the tape. So what we can do is, for those of you who want the written form, we can send you. Or we can put it up on the site and you can access it. So, or, or specifically, if you want <laughs> printed notes to be sent, you let us know and we will post it to you. But yeah, we are here to help you to, you know, remember this. Okay, let's get back to the subject. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Any thoughts that you'd like to bring in? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start the process. Um, uh, uh, just to go back to one of your points, uh, Praveen, and uh, uh, that is not, not discussing the, the point you, discussion point you brought up, but you mentioned about uh, the, Paul's um, reiteration that there will be no more Jew, Jew or Greek, male, female. Uh, there are, I think, many people who uh, confuse or tend to think of something called replacement theology. Some of you may have heard of this thing called replacement theology, that the church replaced Israel as the chosen people. And there are many who believe that the church is the new Israel. So can you say something on that, Praveen, in case uh, any one of you have the same question? Uh, both are not uh, Christian understandings or Christian understanding of, uh, uh, you know, Christian understanding of church. Church is never, church was never meant to replace Israel as if Israel is the first plan and then uh, church is replacing it. Mm. Okay. God has one plan and he's very clear about it. That is to make entire humanity as body of Christ. Yeah. So Israel, uh, we are not, we are not uh, replacing Israel number one. As I told you 
previously also there is some kind of thirst deep within us mm -hmm. especially we christians we want to identify or we want to find ourselves in the old testament stories israel is there so i am from india i should how can i relate to it you know somehow we want to find uh, so many people they call uh, you said replacement there some people they call themselves as a spiritual israel and uh, Israel church is the spiritual is it, this is not true because God never said uh, that I mean I mean from the scripture it is very clear that he is loving only one particular community and he want to make everybody uh, Israelites so if he wants to make it that Jesus makes no sense actually if God wants us to make us Israelites he can command us to be circumcised he can command us to be obeying the law these things and all but the scripture very clearly says that god so loved the world god he loves the world number one and he is the one set the borders for all the nations according to apostle paul in acts chapter 17 which tells god respects our ethnicity and it is according to his plan and at the same time in even in the book of revelation it is written i personally feel uh, purposefully god made john to write this there will be people from all the nations people from all the languages that is what uh, apostle john writes if church is a spiritual israel this kind of description that does not suit then it should say all the world has become israelites and were worshiping the lord all the world has joined the family of israel and israelites and worshiping the lord that is not the description scripture gives scripture gives that god is the one who designated all these borders and ethnicities languages different uh, created opportunity to for this cultures and to grow and he respects and he loves the diversion sorry not diversion distinctions all these diverse cultures he likes and uh, he never wanted to make uh, israel uh, entire world so that is not a christian understanding god loved the entire world in fact uh, the plan when he chose abraham itself it is said through you all the nations shall be blessed that is the focus he has that's all it is not through you uh, i'm going if he wants all the nations are to be uh, jewish and uh, he can he can make all the he can bring all, i mean just like another event like noah thing can happen and only abraham children can be spread in the world anyway uh, those are some funny thoughts Uh, but basically from the scripture from its description we understand that god loves the di uh, di diversity and god respects the diversity and even in the age to come there will be all these nations with different languages and all and they will be praising god and i believe god is going to love that so just for uh, clarity uh we uh, do not subscribe to this uh, replacement theology as though the church is the new israel or spiritual israel uh we believe that israel was chosen uh to lead to the gentiles also being included so it's a inclusion inclusion plan not a replacement plan <laughs> right and that also makes sense with the law the law was given to israel as a nation and so i think it makes sense that now uh we as god's people have a new way of looking at law as uh, pravin said that the law we 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 look at it from a spiritual perspective right so um may i say something yes vincent go ahead in romans 96 it says no for not all who are born into the nation of israel are truly members of god's people and in 98 it says only the children of promise are considered to be abraham's children so that's right those who are who are believers of christ they are considered to be abraham's children not the physical uh what do you call nation of israel okay 
So Vincent, what you're saying is that uh, uh, it's, it's not, not a, yeah, it's Go not ahead. like uh, it's not replacing it. It's the replacement theory doesn't come into play over here, yeah. but it says the children of promise are considered to be Abraham's children. It doesn't, he's not talking the physical nation of Israel in this case. Yeah. And may I add uh, something to what Vincent already said? That's a beautiful point, uh, Vincent. You noticed when you brought to our attention. And there is another place where Apostle Paul speaks a similar statement that is in Romans chapter 4. 4 and 5, he speaks about uh, Abraham and his children, children of promise. Jacob is the children of Jacob. He speaks about Jacob and uh, uh, he says uh, he is the child of promise. And then he gives Abraham believed in God and it is accounted to him as righteousness. And those who are of faith are uh, children of Abraham. That's what is there are these are things the these are analogies apostle paul brought and as i said old testament images apostle paul used and he developed them which we'll be discussing a little uh, in the next uh, uh, session there are lots of old testament uh, imagery apostle paul has taken and which he developed and uh, what we need to un understand from this uh, image development or analogy is not we should not literally read all those we need to find the particular theme through that analogy analogy so what apostle paul wanted to say is whoever is of faith they are accepted to god and they are children of god and all the blessings that are given to abraham they are they they can they are, uh, i mean these people also can um, uh, you know these promises are for them also that's what he meant so there are certain places where he used Old Testament images and he developed them to bring some theological themes here. So when we read those, we should be careful. We are not, we should not be reading them literally and say, uh, we are again becoming children of Abraham like that also should not be taken. We should be taken. We are the people who are beneficiaries of God's blessings. We have a few minutes left. Any, any other thoughts? Otherwise, let me just highlight one more point, which I think is a very, uh, very important point. I have a slight internet problem. Can you, can you still hear, hear me? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the vicarious life of Christ, uh, Praveen, and, uh, uh, and this whole concept of substitution, you know, we, we also subscribe to that in the past, substitutionary atonement or a substitutionary theory. Uh, uh, but what we've come to see is that Jesus did not just substitute, substitute for us, but he literally walked in our shoes. He entered our humanity, right? He lived out our humanity so that we could enjoy his glorified humanity in the future. In other words, that is the literal, I mean, uh, a very powerful concept that goes, I think, like Praveen said, much, much beyond substitution. Substitution is as though he did something and then he walked away and then we go our own way. No, there is a union that takes place. And that is the difference between substitutionary theory and the vicarious life of Christ. Uh, Thor, I'll just elaborate on that, and that is something very important. Uh, even the substitutionary atonement or, or penal substitution, like they say, is something that we do not fully subscribe to. We go beyond that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Any one of you can make a comment. Mr. Rao, any thoughts on, on the law? <laughs> I think you're doing your own study on the law, right? Anything that uh, strikes you with the discussion today? Uh, 
it is more clear sir now actually it is a new understanding what i was thinking was wrong uh, especially uh, what pravin said is it is like a mirror mm. so uh, and also he said that it's not given to keep it to observe it to follow it that is also a new understanding i think no yeah are you able to hear me sir yes yes we can we have heard you yeah right maybe if i can just say that uh, uh the law is a minimum standard of behavior mm. you know uh and the law is there is a magnification of the law or you could say a a, a greater a, a foundational aspect of the law that we understand today which continues to guide us in our behavioral aspects so to that extent the law gives us and helps us to understand that we need christ pushes us towards faith like was said but it gives us a standard of behavior so we must not think that we don't live under law or are, we don't have a law to live with we have the law of christ like paul says we follow the law of christ today which is all encompassing when compared to the old covenant law and i don't know if uh, you want to add anything to that sorry yeah definitely this perspective is called uh, antino uh, antinomianism uh, there is something called antinomianism which uh, says we don't have any law we don't need to do any uh, any standards any gui guidance these are not there you do whatever you want to do and you love christ so that's how most of the people think when we say uh, we are not under the law god delivered us from the law and we are dead to the law means this is the kind of notion many people uh, feel and they get scared about uh, how how it can be uh, whether if there is no law there is no principles and all that's how we get scared but the reality is as i told you in the message also we are not going to live by the letter of the law but we are going to live by the spirit of the law letter is saying it is written like this you should be doing like that even you cannot change a dot in that the spirit of the law is why it has been said the way it has been said and when we understand it we live worthy of it see i have a very small kid now she now she is climbing up the tables and she is putting her fingers in the electric sockets okay now she is in a place we are telling her no don't put your fingers there so that is the law don't put your finger there that is the law but later when she understand if i put my finger in that she i will get electric shock it hurts me and once she understands that what happens she lives by the spirit of the law why my father said not to do this so she she is not going to touch it anymore once she understands that so the same way we are in now the law says don't do this do this and all we'll understand why, why is it like that when we in the in the relationship we have in we have with god that is where we are living in the spirit of the law in the newness of the spirit we will be living so the same uh, the standards of living are not going to change and previously the law is like a, a mirror it is not able to change our behavior it is going to guide us towards someone who is able to help us in this situation that is jesus once we come to jesus we don't need this guiding law anymore we are going to become we are going to grow above it that is what we are talking about so basically by we are not the law was not given to us so that we may obey it and uh, we may be acceptable to god we may become righteous no that is not at all it is given to show us something is completely wrong with us we are corrupt we need a savior and uh, so that we may come to jesus once we come to jesus he pours his spirit in us uh, we, through which we are going to live newness of life and that life is going to be above the standards that law sets
Okay, well, we have just crossed the hour. So thank you once again for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, let's close with a prayer. And if I can request our elder, Mr. Franklin, can you lead us in a closing prayer? Gracious Father, our loving Lord, thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to come meet and then discuss ask our questions, seek clarifications. Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being with our pastor and Praveen and helping us to understand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for all of us, Lord, who come here week after week. Lord, open our hearts and minds. Lord, only you have to unlock our hearts and minds to understand spiritual truths. Lord, we ask, Father, your grace be with us and touch us. And will help us, Lord, to grow into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you day by day. And may we grow as your children at all times. Lord, we ask your blessings upon all of us and even those who could not join us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Father. We do ask, Father, that you will make these, Father, that you will touch the hearts of even the others who are not here with us but they will subsequently listen to these clips and learn and grow. Thank you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.